All right. And so funny. what we'll usually do is we'll you can put it on your channel, let it be there a bit. And then at some point in the future, I'll put it on my channel. That helps people find your channel a little bit more easily. So oh, that's very kind. How much time do you have today? Uh, I can I can I can go a couple hours. Okay. That's good. Um I recently listened to your interview with Christian Baxter, who I met two days ago in the live oh, really? stream. Yeah. I was about to sleep. And um, I follow him on Twitter because he followed me recently. And then I saw it pop up and I just put my lamp on. I was like, let me say hi, because I'd love to know, get to know Christian. <laughs> so in preparation for this, I was like, let me just see who interviewed Paul. And um, Christian did, and he did it excellently. Yeah, he did. And then I discussed. Talk. Yeah, very well. I spoke with Aaron about it because Aaron knows you a bit. And I was like, what should I do with this talk? Because Paul is an open book, you know? Um, so a lot of his life is already known. So what are you even going to interview him about? It? And um, you should you should tell people that Aaron is your brother. Aaron's been on yes, the channel. Yes, Aaron was at the Breakwater. And up. that I'm really sorry to miss this next Breakwater event. I have a son who's getting married, so I can't I can't make it. But um, yeah. I'm you know the the Breakwater keep keep an ear out because it's at your father's place, right? Yeah, so that's the idea. I have a similar problem because I'm getting married myself just before it. So I oh. might be on honeymoon. So we'll see. But hopefully the good reason not to be there. <laughs> so so yeah, first I thought I'm gonna interview you, but then I realized probably that's not even that interesting. So I did write down some questions, but I'd like to just have a talk and see see where it leads us. Okay. Um I will start with this. I I had a couple of bigger names on recently on my channel and I saw what effect it had on people first. And then I saw for myself that it kind of made me want to one up it every time. And that was like a nasty spirit, you know? So now yeah. I'm trying to ground myself. Yeah. And so the funny thing is when I got into this corner, I never got into your videos. They just never popped up to me. I was, I was just into the, the thinky talky, Peugeot, Verveke, and um, and Peterson, of course. Yeah. But now more and more, I see the value of your format. So I'm just going to ask you for some wisdom on that. What is the reason that you are able to stay grounded and that you are able to continue to uh, talk to so many randos and that you never got caught up in... Um, in all the views, let's say. Yeah, that's, I guess, a question. To start that's a with. great question. And you are exactly right in noticing that the analytics are tempting. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, I think about Chris Williamson, who has, you know, he's built a big channel. He's made a career. It's his day job. And YouTube has invited and drawn many people into YouTube as a career. I am not interested in YouTube as a career. I already have a career. Um, I I don't mind, you know, I, there's a membership thing. And so I do derive a little bit of income from YouTube. And basically because um, of the situation my church is in, I haven't had a raise in years. So the YouTube is basically giving me the raise I've never had for, for a long time. So that's fine. But I also noticed I have on rare occasion gone out to sort of attract, do a conversation with higher status people. And then you put it on the channel and you see the increase in, you see the increase in your analytics and your views. And you think, oh, I can keep climbing this ladder. And again, the ladder is fine. There's really nothing wrong with the ladder, but you really have to ask yourself, what do you want? Because the truth is you can go, I can go out and I can get a conversation with Tom Holland or Mary Harrington. I have a little bit more, I have more relationship with Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke because they got in earlier. But what tends to happen is that that Dunbar number is there and Either your your community is going to move around, and let's say as someone you know, someone like Jordan Peterson, his community moved up a hierarchy, and that's fine. You can have a community of high status elite people around you in whatever hierarchy you've moved up, but hierarchies bind and blind. 
I remember this during the Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, you know, when Bernie Sanders first sort of ran for president, a bit, it was made a big deal of that he pumps his own gas, he shops for his own groceries. Hillary, Hillary Clinton, didn't pump. She hadn't pumped her own gas in years. She hadn't bought her own groceries in years. I mean, in Europe, you can sort of translate this. In America, pumping gas is just sort of what every man has to do or every woman. So you just you just rise up these elite ranks. And and to a degree I have, but my hierarchy's been pretty low. And part of why I never wanted and I, you know, part of why I really try to keep Living Stones alive is just for me in that I love doing this local work. I love, you know, like we were late getting started because the ladies Bible study, the women's Bible study is starting and I have I have a nice piece of cake from Marshall and Marshall just explained to me how she got this recipe from a cookbook that was from her seventh grade class. Now, Marshall is in her mid eighties. And so that was from seventh grade in Jim Crow, Louisiana. And, and she says, well, it's not quite as sweet there. I didn't put as much sugar in and I separated it. And, and so what's fun about this is that when I eat this cake, I remember cakes from when I was young because everything has changed. And I would very quickly lose all of these very rich relationships if I was divorced from Living Stones. And more and more of my relationships would be online and my life would change. And again, there's nothing wrong with online relationships. It's nothing wrong with having a friend group in a high status hierarchy. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. In a sense, all of those things must happen, but I don't know that I want them to happen to me. And I'm older, but in your case, I think it's actually quite important that they not happen to you. Yeah. Because you will very clue you will very soon lose touch with the majority of human beings, at least even in your own. So the Netherlands is its own, you know, it's got a, it's, you know, it's got its own status hierarchy, but you will very quickly lose touch with an entire cohort and generation that's far larger and broader. And now suddenly you will know the masses by something mediated by screens or statistics, but it won't have the same kind of reality that this cake from a 86 year old African American woman named after her grandfather. Everybody wondered, that's a strange name for a girl, but she was named after her grandfather. And so I know so much about the world because I am not, and it's not mediated by a status hierarchy. So that's part of the reason why I. I mean, I have the same temptations and desires in me. If a if a video does very well analytically, I get excited about it. But then I also, then suddenly, I talk to I talk to a someone that I know in this area who was on Jordan Peterson's channel, and he has sort of a little business, and it's connected with his YouTube and all of that. But it's not exactly his YouTube. So YouTube isn't his business, but he uses YouTube for promotion. And after he went on Jordan Peterson, of course, boom, up, you know, all kinds of emails, all kinds of this, all kinds of that. It's fairly destabilizing. And, you know, Jordan Peterson's life was transformed and two very, two careers he loved destroyed by dramatic growth. Sunday, we have our little nine o'clock estuary at church, and usually we have six to 10 people there. And this past Sunday, we had one, two, three, four, five, six brand new people, some of whom were visiting from out of state or out of the area, of course, drawn because of my YouTube channel. And it was great meeting. It was great meeting. And we could handle six. I couldn't handle 60. That kind of growth, the only thing we sort of notice about that in terms of biology is cancer. So um, for what, you now again, if 
Chris Williamson, he needs numbers. This is what he wants to do. He keeps reaching for higher and higher status. People to interview, great. Want to play that game? Play that game. But every game has its trade-offs, and I like the trade-offs that I have made with respect to. And, you know, hey, I haven't been – I was blessed with a little bit of initial growth early on just by timing and dumb luck, but I've also been blessed that the growth sort of flattened out, and I like the way it's grown, and I I really enjoy it. So that's, that's my advice. <laughs> that's really good. I think – Maybe for Chris Williamson, it's also not a very good thing what happened, but I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I won't judge. I won't judge him because I don't know. I really don't know. I'm just glad it's not me. For me, it's also it's it's really. I don't feel judgment for it, but I kind of feel a bit worried. Do you know? Yeah. Because it's like you say, if if it happens on the biological scale, it's cancer. So yeah. if I understand reality to be fractal, then probably it's not a very good thing. No, but in it, general, I guess hard. it'll be hard on your marriage. It'll be hard on your family relationships. It'll be hard on your friendships. That's like, if I wanted to talk to you before, I could just pick up the phone and talk to you. Now I have to get a Calendly appointment. Yeah. I think that the more I started doing with YouTube, actually, the more also I started to ground myself into my environment. Um, it was more in the time that I was listening to podcasts, like, you know, the crazy numbers just yeah. every day, all day. That's when I was more on board. But now that I'm engaging, I'm actually making videos myself. I find myself listening less and interacting with my environment more. So <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with that trajectory thus far, but I'm going to try to stay grounded. And luckily I have good people around me. Um, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's good. But it's it's great advice. I'm very happy with with what you're doing. For those who don't know you, you should probably mention you've been on Karen Wong's The Meaning Code channel a couple of times. You've told your story there. And so, you know, people yeah. can if they're curious about your background, um, you and you actually have a very interesting background, um, given uh, your father and your family life and your story. And we don't have necessarily have to go over any of that, but it is, a, it is a very interesting story. And I think your father's done quite a, and your mother, I don't want to cut, I haven't met her, but um, I don't think I've met her, but um, I mean, I think your father's done a rather remarkable thing in terms of crafting his family and, and trying to figure out, um, you know, all of the trade-offs in life. And, um, yeah. and I think you and your brother both have been beneficiaries of that. No, absolutely. I don't mind talking about it a bit just for context because um, my father, both my father and my brother also listen to these types of things and they have also been on your channel. So that's pretty funny. But the background is, is that I'm um, the fourth child of six children in the Netherlands. And my that's father a big is family a, in the Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's always funny when you tell people they're like, what? <laughs> but uh, no, he's a theologian. At least that's part of what he is. He did a PhD in theology, but he didn't do the master's or the bachelor's. He just handed in a master's thesis and they accepted him. Um, but that's always been his biggest passion. And we were raised religious, but a lot of us ran away from that. Um, raised in the Protestant tradition. And for a lot of us, that was either too boring or it got us to take religion, um, understand it in a materialistic paradigm, which will be familiar to a lot of you. And I got to thank my brother mostly for getting out of that, Aaron, who some of you will be familiar with, because he started blabbering on about Peterson at some point. And I was just a bit, I always had an aversion to it because Aaron wouldn't shut up about it. So <laughs> that was my initial idea. And then you started listening to him. And um, that really helped me in my life for sure. I would say that Peterson is the reason that I'm getting married and um, I got my life <laughs> straightened out. But yeah, and that's actually something I see with a lot of people. It's like when they encounter Peterson, their relationships get better and everything gets better, basically. Yeah. Well, I, if, if they listen to Peterson. 
Yes. It's hard to. <laughs> yeah. Can't just encounter. You have to listen and you have to try mm -hmm. to understand and integrate something. So, yeah. 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 No, so that's just a short version of where we are. I'm, I'm a university student. I study Egyptology. Um, I'm about to finish that up at least a bachelor's. I'm not sure if I will continue with it, but it's a, it's a great way to dive into some of the topics that my, my father had been occupied with. Um, and it's mostly language actually, which I didn't know because I didn't really look at the description to my uh, foolishness. A, but, oh, pyramids, hieroglyphic statues. That sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's going to yeah, be a lot basically. of language. <laughs> It's like three years. You think hieroglyphics are fun until you have to do it for three years. Like, what is this nonsense? You know? So what have Which you I learned from it? So what, what, what are some of your takeaways of studying Egyptology? That we don't know much of anything about Egypt. Um, and what we do know is not very interesting. We have some propositional facts. Yeah, it's just true. I'm, I'm sad to say. We have <laughs> propositional facts about Egypt. And that's fun. We have some historical record, and that's pretty fun. But Jonathan Peugeot says it pretty well. He says, we have no idea what that's what those things actually say. Like, you can translate the text, but the symbolism is so far from us. The Greeks, you can understand partially, but the Egyptians, they're so far from us that, yeah, it's, it's, it's not really, <laughs> you don't get a lot of meaning out of reading those texts. Interesting. Sadly. Yeah. Until you... Uh, <laughs> for three but to be fair like i want to i'm gonna be fair to, to what i did like it's it's interesting and it's in its own right some people get a lot of meaning out of it but i have a deep hunger for uh, wisdom as well and not just archaeology and i think people that are more geared toward the materialistic side of egypt might find it super interesting i mean the the structures are insane like uh, unbelievable i understand why people think that aliens made them um, it's 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 crazy and i don't think even now we have good explanations for how they did that but it's also not very important to me it's, i thought it was important when i started but so then so you're about to finish up your degree what do you want to do next well i was thinking about perhaps pursuing a degree in latin america studies simply oh. because i uh, i speak spanish and i'm learning portuguese from brazil and it would just be a bit of a broader master to give me some chance in the job market because uh <laughs> you mean you mean that the, the market for e people with a bachelor's degree in Egyptology is just not off the charts? It's not off the charts. It's there, but I mean, oh. it's not off the charts. No, sadly. But um, it's a funny thing. Like people go in, and my teachers told me at the start, like maybe two percent of you is going to become an Egyptologist. Most of you will give up or <laughs> do something else. And it's what happened. I'm, I'm, I'm left with one person after three years. Um, so yeah, that's where we are. But well, why I, honestly, Latin America? Why Latin America? I guess it's the it's the minor I'm doing. I do it in Latin America studies, and it's always pulled me. After Egypt was my biggest fascination because I think that the ancient civilizations there are extremely interesting because it's understudied and it's under understood. I don't know if that's an English word. But that, that part is already interesting. And then the recent history is also fascinating because to me, it seems like the more I study that, the more it seems like a more extreme version of what happens in Europe and in the US. Like this, they swing from, from left to right like crazy throughout the history. And it's extremely bloody and violent. And it's just intriguing for me to understand. They recently elected a libertarian president in Argentina. It's like, how does that happen? Like that would never happen here. Yeah. Our libertarian party has two people and nobody knows them. Like we, we, do, we don't know about those ideas. So it's just a uh, Latin America is just, to me, it's, it's very interesting from a distance, but it's a very big place. Yes. Mostly there are a lot of problems. And I think I, I'm happy to help think about problems that require solutions that actually help because I went into Egypt because of curiosity, but I'm thinking more about Latin America because of responsibility, I guess. But yeah, I'm not sure about that. That I'm gonna do that. I might just start a job. Have you visited much in Latin America? Have you visited? Oh, not at all. This is how I choose what I study. It's just I need to have the smallest reason to do it, and I just do it because it's it's intriguing to me. 
I also haven't been to Egypt, if you're wondering. <laughs> but I don't want to get off track. I don't Maybe you should track. study lunar studies because, you know, the, the group of people have actually been to the moon is very small indeed. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. But um, no, so I. Yeah, the, the day, nobody warned you about the danger of interviewing me. Unless you have a firm idea of where you want to go, you'll wind up with me interviewing you. That's the way these things always go. So. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. You go all the way back to my conversations with Peugeot. We're just gonna have a conversation. I'm just, I'm just so darn nosy, and questions pop up immediately. So I'll, if, if you let me, I'll run the train. So beware. I'll be where I try to center us when we have to, but um, I do know, like for me, it's like, I know where I want to go with the important stuff. Okay. People ask me, but people think that the career is the important stuff. For me, it's, it's, it's like number five or something. And I, and I should mention that I owe, I owe Lucas a, a debt of gratitude too, because when I was in Amsterdam, you were part of that small group of people and <laughs> that, that lovely mother and her long suffering baby and we walked all around that city on a very rainy day. And I, I couldn't believe how 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 well that baby did and how patient that mother was. And that was a that yeah. was a that was a fun day. So that was I took day. a lesson from that baby because that yeah. baby knows sign language. Um That's right. and I started I started using it. So this is more. This is done or something too much. And this is where? Where? So it's great when we got on the boat, that baby starts. Ah, now yeah. the baby, he had a chance to wander, and it was fun. It was a fun. It day. was ready to go. Yeah. What was your impression of that? Actually, the Netherlands. Is this the first time you visited, or it was the there... second time? It was the first time I'd been in Amsterdam. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you had an but, interesting impression of it, I think. So let, let well, us know. That for me, the Netherlands. So the Christian Reformed Church in North America. So many people were immigrants that. The Netherlands, for many people, became this fabled place, and it has a it has its own reality in the Dutch immigrant community, um, and and there's both positive and negative because a lot of the people. So my ancestors left the Netherlands in the 1890s, but then there was another boom after World War II, and a lot of those immigrants went to Canada and uh, the West. Uh, California. And so, um, you know, there was sort of a, uh, there was sort of a nostalgic bit about it. And there was sort of the cohesive thing in the Christian Reformed Church. You know, we like Ole Bolin. Um, you know, there was, there's this great story in New Jersey when um, one of the elders from my church that I grew up in got on an airplane and noticed that a lot of the people on the airplane were from the Christian Reformed Church in New Jersey. So he gets on the airport and he says, I'm been out. And of course, all you could just see everybody who grew up in the Christian Reformed Church because they knew what been out meant and nobody else in the airplane would know. And so there's all of this little subculture interest in the Netherlands, but there was always a, a negative, um, there was always sort of a negative thing about it too, because many of the people who came to the United States, joined the Christian Reformed Church were were fairly conservative in their religious posture. And the, the take on the Netherlands was, oh, after, you know, the Netherlands, it's the church is just not what it was and it's not the same. And so you had all of this stuff. So for me, going to the Netherlands was fascinating. And of course, my first trip, I followed Job and John Van Donk and uh, we had to stop at every herring stand you could find in the country <laughs> and uh, eat raw fish. And Job just sort of shook his head. Job was... Job was a patient saint on that trip. Um, and then so the second visit was was different because I didn't have been dunk and spent a, a lovely time in The Hague with uh, with Eve and uh, visited her lovely church there and then on to Amsterdam and also stayed with uh, Ferdy and Cassidy, which was awesome because I could see another aspect of the country. So for me, just kind of my awareness of the country just sort of slowly continues to grow. And it's fascinating to me how, how the Netherlands, this tiny little country, is such a, a potent, interconnected uh, thing in the world. It's really a quite fascinating thing. And your father, I mean, I, I always, when your father talks, I always listen to him because he's also got a ton of wisdom and 
uh, he notices a lot of things. And so I always listen to him when he talks. As a, I learn a ton from him. So for me, going to the Netherlands is just absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, I, I'm not going to get a chance to go there next summer. I'm going to be in Italy for about a month. It'd be my first chance to go to Italy. And I'm really looking forward oh, to really? that. So, awesome. um, but I, but I've been in Europe twice and most of the time I've been in the, the, the UK and the Netherlands and then just in and out of Germany quickly. So I really haven't gotten much of a chance to get to know Germany either. So I'm really looking forward to this trip to Italy because, oh gosh, Pompeii, Florence, Rome, Venice. I'm going to try and cram little bits of all of that in. So. I think we'll the see. countryside is the best, to be honest. Yeah, well, it's I'll be spending a week. So my my son, one of my sons decided he wanted to get married in Italy. I think his fiance decided that. So that resolved the <laughs> wedding list dilemma that every uh, wedding planner faces. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we'll get, we're going to get married in some little villa in Tuscany. That's where they're going to get married. So oh, be, that's lovely. Yeah, it'll I be love beautiful. Tuscany. Yeah. That's good. I uh, I've been following your little thing with um, Ben Graham. Can you remember Dempsey? Dempsey yeah. Yes. So I just watched that this morning to to gear up for this, and I thought he had a beautiful story, <laughs> romantic story too. And um, yeah, I'd like to get a bit of your feedback. What do you make of 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 him? This movement. Um, to me, I feel like he is someone that is not satisfied with just returning to what there is right now. Yep. What do you think of that in your position? I think it's easier to go back to, it's easier to go into a program that is set. So I think for many going, returning to orthodoxy or Catholicism, or maybe the church that they grew up in, that's easier because to one degree or another, okay, well, here are the rules. Someone's going to tell me what to do. Uh, I don't have to, I don't have to make all of this stuff up. I can just follow this project. And there's a real benefit to that. But as you said, there are many people who say, that's not really for me. And, you know, even for myself in, in that way, you know, obviously, with so many people going into orthodoxy or Catholicism, people are like, "Well, Paul's gonna, Paul's gonna go orthodox, or Paul's gonna go Catholic." Eh, no, I don't think so. I'll, I, I want to stay in my own tribe, uh, the Christian Reformed Church. But yeah, I also think that uh, Dempsey is right in that things will continue to change. And I also think that for many who, let's say, are doing orthodoxy, they are going to change orthodoxy too. It's going to go both ways. It always does. And um, I, I think it's, I think it's easier to go to an established project because there's just. I remember the first time I heard John Verveke talk about a religion that's not a religion. Now he's he's hence you know really qualified all of that. Say so I'm not trying to start a new religion, the Silk Road. So now he's trying to connect various religious traditions and people and the nuns too. I get all that, but I remember when he first said it, I thought you just don't have enough time in your life to build everything anew, and and that's part of the the issue that's going on in the whole gender liberation realm where. If you're gonna, if you're, if you decide you're going to pioneer your own gender, well, there's your life. There is your whole life, because a gender is such a massive thing, and it's connected to so many other things that, you know, you're not gonna have time to study Egypt or Latin America or theology or something like that. All you'll be, all you'll be about is gender. So I hope you really like it, because there's your life. So it's just. With as foundational as religion is, I think it's just a highly practical move to find an established tradition that you can really love and be at home in and say, I'm going to devote myself to this. Because now suddenly there's, again, it's sort of like my, my wife and I, my wife in some ways, in a strange way, as the kids have gone out into the world, 
we've outgrown our home. And usually at this point, people are looking for a smaller home. We're looking for a bigger home because we want to have all of our children in it. So then it's like, well, do we remodel? What do we do? The my, What my wife and I recognize about ourselves is if we had to, let's say, build a house from scratch, you know, the number of decisions that go into that, what style of a house will it be? What foundation will it have? Uh, are the walls going to be two by four or two by six? What insulation are you going to use? And then to get into decor, what, you know, there's just a million decisions to make. And so for us, we would rather walk, go into different houses, look at them and say, yeah, we like this. Well, why do you like that? Oh, I just like it. And I don't want to spend the next five years making choices about it because someone with good taste and some wisdom, more wisdom than I've had enough chance to accumulate, has made good choices. So I'm going to live in that house. Is it going to be perfect? I might change some things. You know, we might tweak this or that. We'll make it our own. But the million decisions that have gone on into that house, the combinatorial explosiveness of that house, I don't have to worry about. And so I think for most people, again, even though they're sort of called legacy religions, the more practical way is to actually look for a tradition that's close enough and then make it your own. And I, I think it's just, I think it's just wise. And so now... Brendan wants to, you know, and now he's got a little space in Northern Vermont. He, he's he got a YouTube channel, you know, just recently he did a video on, on a catechism. And for me, again, it's like, if I had to write my own catechism, oh gosh, would take me years. I'd rather read the Heidelberg Catechism and maybe tweak it for context today, which is something that has been done for 500 years with this catechism, just about. So that's kind of the pragmatics, uh, pragmatic approach that I take. That's good. I The way I think about it myself is that Peterson had a talk with Jocko Willink, and he discussed this verse. Um, and it was about doing things that don't rust or something like this, something along these lines. And he's like, you don't want to... Um, well, it was about wealth. He said, you don't want to store your wealth in money. You want to store your wealth in reputation or something like this. It would make this whole argument. But the thing that stuck out to me was that he said something along the lines of you want to do actions. You want to act in a way that can be replicable on a larger scale and um, that wouldn't do damage to other people, let's say. Yeah. And so I, I just, I cannot see myself as the exception. That's one of the reasons why I um, steadfastly call myself a Christian because I'm just, I'm like, <laughs> I'm afraid of the alternative because <laughs> I, I can see it derail so hard if that scales. Like if I intellectually decide I'm better than this or something and that, that leads to on the lower scale, lower scale in terms of people that don't really think or question them to abandon, then, then I'm worried for that, for those consequences. Um, that's endless. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's true. I think it's a good, I think that's, I think there's real wisdom there. The thing is I'm 22 and I'm like, I'm an idiot, you know? So if I'm already at the stage of propositional beliefs that a lot of 60 year olds are at, then I don't know where I'm going to be at in 10 years, you know, maybe I'll, yeah. <laughs> I always wonder about that. Like You don't know where you're going to be at in 10 years, no, which that's is true. okay. And that's why you, you really want to have, Again, what, what you really want to have around you are trustworthy, wise people that yeah. know you and care about you and love you, that you know and care about and love. And that's basically how human beings find their way and don't do stupid things. Yeah. Are you ever going to stop? Ever going to stop what? You Talking? Too. <laughs> your youtube channel is it ever something you want to give up oh there, there are days when i think i gotta stop this um <laughs> but that those are days when um again going back to what i said earlier i do want to prioritize my real life yeah 
and the virtual life is good. And, you know, I got to be careful here because Grim Grizz is going to watch this. And and if if you too harshly demote the virtually not alone, uh, he gets upset and he says, you're you're devaluing something that is real. And I would say it's real enough. Uh, but the 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 beyond the screen is better. Um, I, I, I will obviously stop someday. Um, I don't know when I will stop when I have a reason to stop. Um, yeah. I've found it useful. I've found it helpful. It's dangerous in some ways, but I'll, you know, there's no reward without risk. So, yeah. so I'll, I'll stop at some point, but <laughs> you know, I, you'll know when I stop because I stop. Yeah. There might be a pause at some point too. That could happen. That happens in life too. So mm -hmm. who knows? The thing I think about sometimes is with this little corner, it's, it is such a specific digital space with specific people. It's nothing like the church. It's nothing like a real life community. Um, also in the way it's divided by, by gender where it's like, I don't know what the percentage is, but I think it's, it's dominated by men, especially the more intellectual stuff. And that worries me a bit, especially if that's your only community. Um, so, yeah, that's, no, that's it, can't, it shouldn't like... be your only community. And if it is your only community, make sure you're working on growing some meat space community. And which is why, which is why, again, estuary is to me such an important thing because, okay, maybe, maybe you can't handle the, propositional beliefs of a church or something like that, you're going to need something that you can be around people and form community. And so maybe you can't tolerate a church, but maybe you can go to a estuary. We'll have John Van Donk in September here. I just saw on the WhatsApp chat. So yeah. it's very, very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He'll, he'll be, he'll be shilling that estuary as hard as it can be, as hard as it can be shilled. <laughs> I wonder if, if he'll he'll let us do it in Dutch. It would be funny to see. I hope so. I hope so. But do you you Dutchman, your English is so darn good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know it, where that it, comes from. It's really interesting because in a lot of ways, when I look at the English of the Dutch and the English of the English, your English is way more American than the UK's English. It's yeah. very interesting. I think that's TV. You know, we grow up with um american pop culture mostly yeah especially my generation like i'm i'm 22 and from age six or seven i was just immersed in america <laughs> in terms of hollywood and yeah. like all the tv shows and the video games also especially yeah. um not as much british yeah yeah TV well because it's interesting because i mean You've got a little bit of a Dutch accent. Just, you know, you yeah. catch a few words. Again, growing up, those people who came off the boat, as we used to say, I mean, they'd have a thick Dutch accent. And and yeah. and then their children would mock them in terms of some of the, the funny. They were clearly speaking Dutch with English words. And every now and then the Dutch would pop through. But, I mean, you're, I mean, I someone, an American might listen to you uh without paying much attention to just simply assume you're american yeah that's also it's funny when i just started listening to podcasts i was 18 and listened to a lot of um southern american well southern usa and i had that accent i had it i listened to old stuff of myself it was crazy how quickly you're influenced by that yeah and now it's yeah. kind of like leveled out to a, a more of a neutral accent also i live with my partner she's french so we speak english together so i barely actually speak dutch unless i have to um so yeah it's actually changed over the last two years even <laughs> it's funny to see it, it it's really a that's a that's an amazing thing that's an amazing yeah. thing uh let's talk about new ageism and psychedelics because okay. there's something i've never heard your opinion about but not, not fully at least Hmm. Then I have a fun question is whether or not you would ever touch psychedelics or whether you have. <laughs> I have never. You have never? I don't really want to. You don't want to? Okay. No, I, I, I don't. About that. I don't. Um, I don't drink alcohol, not because I'm a recovering alcoholic, but I don't like the taste of it. And I, I don't smoke. Um, and I 
I mostly avoid caffeine unless I have to drive somewhere and I have to stay awake and then I'll drink okay. caffeine if I know I have to stay awake. But other than that, I, I avoid caffeine and I, maybe I'm just sort of a self-control freak. I don't like, um, I don't like feeling not in control of my consciousness or my body. And so for me, the idea of doing a drug that sort of uh, wrenches control of myself from my conscious mind. Now, my, one might say, well, what about religion? Well, I trust Christianity. I trust Christian worship. I trust, trust Christian prayer. I trust these things. And so I do get out of myself in those ways. But psilocybin, LSD, these kind of things, I look at it and think, I no, thank you. <laughs> I don't I don't want to have that trip. I'm not at all interested in going there. Do you fear death? It's it's hard to know what you fear until you're facing it. So there was a um uh there, there was there was one evening when I, um, I felt I, I don't I think I don't remember what it was exactly. I never knew what it was, but my chest felt a little tight and a little bit of pain, and so I thought, well, you know, they always say if you have this, you should, you know. So did the whole thing. My wife, you know, takes me to the emergency room. They strap me up. They do all this, and oh, you're fine. Go home, but. Um, you know, it takes about an hour to go through the whole process. And so then I was just sitting here thinking, you know, my my father died at 77 with a heart attack that was right out of the blue. My sister died at 53 of a heart attack that was right out of the blue. I am fully aware that I could follow them and I could die tomorrow of a heart attack. So when I was you know, sitting there in that ER strapped up to the machines and everything. And um, I was thinking, yeah, this could be it. How do I feel about that? I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid. Now, that doesn't mean that there are, there wouldn't be times when things would sneak up on me and make me afraid to die. I think that's just a super, a very natural thing. And I remember uh, there was another time when I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, and we were <laughs> we were flying down to the Dominican Republic. And at that point, I had one child. So it was my wife and myself and that one child. And we were taking off from Miami, and we're flying to Santo Domingo. And we get up in the air, and we're in the air about 15, 20 minutes. And suddenly, smoke starts filling the cabin of the airplane. And this airplane was full of Dominicans. And a good number of people lost their shit. And it was, it was, and and you could tell that you know that the flight attendants were running around with worried looks on their faces. And very quickly that you could the plane. I mean, most of the time they try to drive those planes. You know, like it's very very easy. John Van Dock can tell you a story about that with respect to buses. But whoosh, you know, suddenly this all this big jetliner goes whoa, and you could tell that we're heading back to Miami and something was wrong and. And actually, by virtue of seats, I was seated, seated a little bit different from a little bit apart from my wife and my son because we'd always look for empty seats and because uh, he was small for a child seat. And I just kind of looked back at her and I thought, oh, this could be it. This this could be it. And uh, it wasn't really a, a sense of panic. But and, and this for me is part of the reason why I advocate uh, long term from childhood, if possible, religious belief and commitment that, um, yeah, none of us know how we're going to react in any given new situation. But if if you've been brought up on the Heidelberg Catechism, on the first question and answer that I belong body and soul and in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, I mean, there, there's a level of that that gets into you so that when you get into a situation, you can say, all right, I belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Jesus, Savior Jesus Christ was fully paid for all my sin with his precious blood. And, you know, and again, to have some of this stuff committed to memory, it's like, okay, I might die right now. How do I feel about that? And you say, well, 
It's not necessarily, the timing is not necessarily of my own choosing, but I believe I will be with the Lord and I believe he will do what's right. And I believe I have been saved by his son, Jesus Christ. So on to the next thing. And where did you, where did you get that? Where did I get what? I didn't get that belief when I was a kid. Well, I don't think I had it when I was a kid. <laughs> I think you, I think you, well, part of the thing is that at this point you're 22 and you know, we, we think we know what we think, but we don't really. Oh. And as you age and you begin to, you get into your forties and you know, somebody from your high school class dies. Oh. And you get into your 50s and a couple more people from your high school class die and you think, oh, huh. and then your kind father dies. Class. Yeah. And then suddenly you begin to realize, oh, I'm not exceptional. I, I'm, you know, and, and, you know, with my, my father, it was funny because he thought he had to write something for something that he was doing once. And he, you know, that, that how long do you think you live? Well, he thought his father, his father lived to 90. So he thought he'd live to 90. That's basically what he said. So, you know, when he, you know, when he died at 77, I, he died so fast. I don't know that he even had a minute to think about it. Uh, I don't know, but we all thought about it when he died at 77. And as I was, I was talking to my mother last night and I was saying, yeah, 77 is sounding younger and younger all the time. Almost everybody in the room over there is over 77. And my wife's, my, my mother not my wife, my mother's now 85. And so, you know, and I think about, okay, 20 years from now, if I live, I'll be 80. I don't feel old. I'm healthy, got energy, could stand to lose a few pounds. Blood pressure's a little high, but that'd probably come off with the weight. Odds are, I saw my father and my grandfather, when they got about my age, they tended to slim down. I'll probably lose this weight at some point. Um, but 20 years ago, I was 40. I, I don't feel a lot different than when I was 40, but I know that when I'm 80, things will be different yeah. when I'm 80. Yeah. So it comes, it comes, okay. life is short. What's your uh, personality like? Did you ever do the Peterson test? Yeah. Oh, I can pull it up. Let's pull it up. All right. I, I always did. love this. The people I get to know, I want to know their personalities. First thing so I did. And, I, I always, I always yeah. pause when I do this because it's like, is, is this like giving out my social security number? Um, <laughs> let me see if I, come on thing. <laughs> Why doesn't that want to start? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Computer is not cooperating. Uh, yeah, so for the people at home, if you've done this, and your partner hasn't do it with your partner because that's extremely helpful in my experience to do that timely i think that it's going to be helpful for your conflicts especially because you'll know where they arise from you got it understand myself big five yeah go. i took this a few years ago when peterson you know made it out there and i thought oh, i want to take this <laughs> i haven't looked at these numbers for a while all what right you which got? numbers you, which numbers you want i want the big numbers the big five Okay. Do you got them? Openness. Oh, 95%. Right. I was going to say is high. Conscientiousness. 85%. Oh. Extroversion. 94%. <laughs> Ocean A. Let's see. Um agreeableness is that the is that the A? Agreeableness 61%. Oh uh, yeah, so, sounds about right. So I'm 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 fairly agreeable, but if you push me in a certain way, I can get disagreeable. <laughs> I've got yeah. that capacity. And then neuroticism, one percent. Wow, that's crazy. So, so I've got a few one percents on this. So I've got a bunch that are over ninety, and a, some that are one. So, so it breaks it down, not just into five. So agreeableness, 61%. Compassion, 72%. I'm a pretty compassionate guy. And again, I don't <laughs> think anybody who's watched a lot of my videos, probably nothing here will, will surprise them. Uh, politeness, 45%. Oh, I'm not really very polite. I can, I can, I can do polite, 
but that number wouldn't surprise people who know me fairly well uh. because there there are times that i'm just not willing to be polite in a situation and that's been by heart valued by certain people yeah um conscientiousness 85 percent industrious this you know given the number of videos i put out 93 percent. so i that's funny i i like to i like to do stuff yeah uh, orderliness this number might be high given the shape of my office uh 60 percent. oh yeah so not real orderly extroversion 94 percent. enthusiasm this won't surprise anyone 89 percent. i'm pretty <laughs> enthusiastic um let's see uh extroversion 94 percent. um assertiveness 92 percent. i can be pretty assertive yeah i can see that uh neuroticism one percent withdrawal one percent i don't like giving up on people and that drives people crazy on youtube because people want me to write off their enemies and it's like not gonna do that eh, i'm probably not gonna write them off uh volatility three percent i'm pretty doggone stable i love routines i i ate the same thing for lunch every day growing <laughs> up in grade school and my mother would like She'd make my lunch and she'd be like, do you want anything different? No, I just, just make, give me the same thing and make it the same way. And it, you know, the same with the house. I don't want to think about what I ate for lunch. I'll just eat that. And then I can move on with other things that are more interesting than lunch. Uh, openness to experience, 98%, except psychedelics, apparently. Yeah, uh, that's surprising then. Yeah. Intellect, 97%, openness, 95%. So, yep, those are my numbers. It's good numbers. I like them. Yeah, they're they're really good numbers because they're very happy numbers. And I noticed yeah. long before any of this that I looked around and I thought, "Gosh, I'm I'm the happiest person I know." I I look at all other kind of other people. And they're miserable and they're they're doing all this other stuff, and I'm just happy. So I I can't take credit for it, but you know, according to Jonathan Haidt, I won the cortical lottery. So happy am I. How do you think? Do you think in words or images or both? Well, both, but probably more in words than images. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm fairly I'm fairly word based, but I do but but that's yeah, yeah. I like words. I like playing with words. I like finding the right word. And when the white right, when when the right word appears, it's like, oh. It's nice. It's the right word. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why I like. That's why I like Grim Grizz because the more you watch Grim Grizz, the more you realize that dude is a hound for the right word. And I'm, I'm, I'm. I can be fast and loose with details, and so sometimes when I do his branding, I get the wording wrong. It's it's, it's like a it's like a <laughs> church father getting a doctrine wrong. We Grizz, yeah. Grim Grizz just won't will not have it. He's all about the exact right word. So, first time I heard the name Grim Griswold, someone asked me, "Do you know about Grim Griswold?" I was like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> I, I saw the first video like a couple months ago, and the way it was edited, it was like it was like masterful. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's he, real he synthesize there. as well, but it's yeah. it's not easy. It's not easy to figure out what he's doing right away. And it's not always easy to sort of track because he jumps. Yeah. But yeah. if you, if you, it's, it's a, you know, what he's doing is genius stuff there. It really is it's yeah. powerful stuff too. It's lots of mind control, even though he, you know, covers it up with his savings throws. <laughs> I'm not fooled. Yeah. You got favorites in the corner. <laughs> I, it, yeah. And that's just it. And, and, and it's a <laughs> funny thing too, because God is no respecter of person. So he's fair, but he also has favorites, of course. which is a funny thing. Yeah. Do you think that, um, I don't know where I heard this, but like this idea that God loves people that walk away and then come back more than people that remain, like the sheep that runs off and the sheep that then comes back. Do you think that there's more love there? There's, there's truth to that. I think the more love or less love is probably uh prone to 
yeah. uh, overreach. I think God's love for the lost sheep is powerful. And, and I think, again, I mean, story can better capture um, can better capture these kinds of dynamics than, let's say, prose. And you look at the you look at the uh, you look at Luke 15 in the parable of the prodigal son. So who does the father love more? The younger brother or the older brother? And and the thing about love is it's not really just something you can put on a scale of one to ten. Because there are lots of different kinds of loves. And of course, the Greeks knew that. And so the love that the father has for the son who runs away and the love that the father has for the son who is there. And the story has both. And so he's not going to, you know, again, if you read Kenneth Bailey, who's written how many books on that parable, he is not going to let the village elders keep his son away. He's going to make sure that his son can come home. But then when the older brother stays in the field, out in the field, away from the father, the older, the, the father goes out and gets him and says to him, all that I have is yours. You know, he says, I love you too, but don't pit my love for your brother against my love for you. They're not exactly the same loves because you're not exactly the same people, but don't pit those loves against each other because that's... And that's a that's a that's a common human thing. I mean, children can get jealous about parental relationships with other children. Uh, spouses can get jealous about parental relationships with children that are even theirs. And when, of course, when for a stepchildren, that's just the way things go. Yeah. But yeah. so so don't pit the different kinds of love against each other because that then basically. It basically denies God and each of us the uniqueness of a relationship between two unique individuals. Yeah, it rings true to me. Sometimes I'd ask my mom, who do you love the most? And she got really upset. <laughs> I would press her on it. But I always I know it was Aaron. I always said I know it's Aaron. Come on. Well, and all the kids, the kids always know who 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 they I know love exactly. The most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kids always know. But and it's like, funny because, you know, now that I, I have five kids and I don't know if my kids would say who I love the most. I think they'd have a hard time figuring that out, to my <laughs> credit. But um they do all know that we love them all differently because they're all different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about let's say myself and my sisters and my mother. You know, I always say, yeah, I'm their favorite. It's clear that I'm their favorite. I'm, I'm the only boy. So, you know, I got that leg up on them. But um, but but they I I you know, I think I think my parents loved us all differently. Because we're different people. Yeah. And 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 there are certain things that we delight in uh from there are different things that we delight in with each of our children. Now, I think the story of Isaac and Jacob and Esau is a strong biblical injunction. Yeah, you're going to have fondness for one or the other for this thing or that thing, but you had better really keep, you know, you'd better really watch that and not let that get out of control because with Jacob and Esau, got out of control in that family. Okay, that works. I like the idea of differently, but not <laughs> more. That would please my parents. They got an out now, you know. I, I'm sure. I'm sure they will validate exactly what I said. Yes. Or improve I, upon it. Yeah. Uh, so, Paul, Christianity is that something that you think is an answer for potentially an answer for everyone? Meaning that any person in the world could potentially be part of the church. Anyone. Oh, that's a big question. Because that question connects up with questions like universalism and hell. Oh. Because, you know, the uh, Philippians 2 says every knee shall bow. All right, what does that mean? Um, it, it basically <laughs> means, what's that? What Brandon wrote on the 
on the wall at his, his school. Do you remember he said that in his story? No. He was in at his public school and he said, Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a great story. That's a great story. Um, <laughs> just imagining this seven year old kid just like, <laughs> Sorry. He's the Christian anarchist in him. <laughs> Uh, you, you can imagine Nate Heil doing something like that too. Um, I, you know, so so Philippians two basically says that everyone will be forced to acknowledge the godness of God and the role of Jesus Christ. I think that's what that verse says. Now, how everyone will take it, and how you know what kind of respect God will afford his image bearers. I mean, part of what's going on now, I'll, I'll say it this way. There's never been a time since the day of Pentecost that everyone who has pledged allegiance to Jesus has been on the same page about a whole number of things. And Paul and the Judaizers. Uh, you got everything going on in the Corinthian church. And our window into that that first century church, I mean, we know so very little about that reality. And it's, I'm glad we know what we know, but we don't know a lot. But we do know they were by no means all on the same page. And we don't know the degree to which, let's say, Paul and James the Just we're not on the same page. I mean, that's a huge topic of biblical scholarship to just figure out just how broad was that group and what 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 was the deal with the the um, the Jewish portion of the church in Galilee and Judea, and then what what was it like in Samaria, and then and then you just go on from there, and you just go through all of church history and find fights and quarrels and disagreements and on and on and on. And then you have to ask questions about, well, the other Abrahamic religions that, um, and not just Islam and Judaism, but LDS, um, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you know, on and on and on and on and on. And then you bump into Tom Holland's thesis, and I think he's right, that basically Christ has been reworking the cultural code of the world. And in one of the sneakiest moves ever, um, the so-called secularism injected a lot of Jesus code, not only into the nations that these Western European, often Protestant um, nations colonized, but Jesus even infected Buddhism and Islam and hinduism and 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 you know jesus is the sneakiest human being that ever lived because he's just he, he's, he's gotten his stuff all over the world so maybe the great abram kuyper um quote that there's not one square inch of creation over which jesus doesn't declare this is mine we might alter it and say well there doesn't seem to be one square inch of the planet that jesus hasn't snuck in and inserted a little bit of his cultural code one way or another. So now when it comes down to, just like with everything in this world, and we can say that word again, combinatorial explosiveness, when it comes down to any given individual's relationship with the church, suddenly we have to deal with, well, what on earth are we talking about with respect to the church? Because, you know, ever since the Protestant Reformation, we've sort of had the invisible church. And, you know, pretty much everyone is very Protestant these days. If you're, unless you're an Orthodox person that says, just Orthodoxy and nothing else. Okay. And then I would pause them and say, okay, uh, and you want to get any more specific with respect to your orthodoxy? Yes. Not the Russian Orthodox. Maybe not even the well, well, what, what, you know, and, and so again, it just gets crazy. So, and, and even before Luther, I think part of 
what happens with differentiation is it causes these forks that as you know tom holland and dominic sandbrook were talking about martin luther i mean in some ways in for most people in western europe it was just the church it's just the church it's just what it was it wasn't the catholic church or the orthodox church and then the lutheran church and the anabaptists and you know the reformed and on and on so this is a really hard question i don't think i can answer it okay. but all of those things are in there yeah yeah i guess i wonder like is there a way to god without christ after the uh, reincarnation is that possible incarnation i should say well, I think, you know, I just did a, a video that not a lot of people watched where I took a clip from that Dempsey conversation where the first interaction I ever had with a podcast was um, out of a, a UK church. They were they were into podcasting early and I listened to them and I really enjoyed it. They were good. And I sent him an email. And because, you know, you have this dynamic where kids all over, I don't know if they all over America, write letters to Santa. And then there's this old movie, Miracle on 34th Street, where Chris Kringle is on trial and his lawyer is going to get him off the hook by proving he's the real Santa Claus and some wags in the uh, in the postal service see the thing on the news and says, oh, Santa's on trial. We got all this mail piling up in the mail room. Let's bring it out of the courtroom and deliver it to him. And so then the lawyer does a fast one and says, see, this proves that he is the real Santa Claus. And so I, I wrote this podcast and I said, you know, what does God do with poorly addressed mail? Well, what is poorly addressed mail? A mail addressed to Allah, mail addressed, addressed to a God, um, you know, a, a power higher than myself, the God of AA, um, you know, Hindus and well, Buddhists don't always have a conception of God, so they don't send a lot of mail. Uh, Bruce Almighty played with this idea a little bit. Um, and so, and I think the AA, that quote that Chad hit on from the big book was really good because the, 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 the AA book basically said that God is not above opening mail that's poorly addressed. I rephrase it that way. And that when, if someone given whatever revelation that they have received sort of turns their eyes to the heavens and says, if anybody's up there, will you listen to me? And I think God says, I'll listen to you. And God does that with his Christians too. We say, okay, well, we are addressing our, our prayers properly. Say, Lord, are you listening to me? Yeah, I'm listening. I might not do what you ask me. I mean, the Psalms are full of that. Lord, why are you so far off, far off? We here with your covenant have the address properly. We even have a place to bring the mail called the temple. I mean, we've we've got it dialed in more than anyone else. So why are you so far off? Why do you let the pagans rule the world and your chosen people live in obscurity and exile? Why, why, why? God says, I open all that mail and I do with it what I choose. That's what really bothers us. In your formulation, then, is the Christian letter the most correctly addressed to God? I think so. Uh, okay. What, what other it. answer? This is where this is my first conversation with Dempsey. What really surprised him? He's like, "Well, why do you believe the the Christian miracles, the biblical miracles, over the Islamic miracles?" Because I'm a Christian. That's, I mean, any anyone not knowing me would say, "Well, it's because he's a Christian." So I just take that answer. It's because I'm a Christian. So I've been formed. How else would I think? I accept it. You know, it's the monarchical vision that imagines, well, if I were if I were born in Scandinavia in 1932, I would do you have no idea who you would be because you wouldn't be you. And the degree that you can sort of mind read another human being after you've been married 35 years, see how well you can mind read your wife. On one hand, you know it really well. On the other hand, she's always surprising you. So if I were a woman born in Africa in 1830, I think I would. What do I know about women in Africa in 1830? You know how big Africa is? I mean, there's all sorts of foolishness that we talk. So when people say, well, why do you talk this way? Well, I'm a Christian. How else am I going to talk? I am me. I'm this one person right here. 
born in a year to certain parents with a tradition, with an education. Of course, I talk the way I talk. I can't talk any other way. Yeah, see, I try to. The thing is, I don't know if I'm allowed to call myself a Christian because I'm just so aware that. Um... Allowed by whom? Is there the Dutch ministry of, of Christian identification? I doubt it. I doubt it too. You see, the thing, Paul, is like, I think about it that I don't know the other traditions, especially not from the inside. So how could I know that my letters are better addressed than theirs? Especially when I see some wisdom exuded or a lot of wisdom exuded from people within other traditions. That That's my only thing. And I know that propositionally, of course, we clash with Judaism and Islam, but I'm just so aware of my limits to my knowledge. And of course, I have faith. Um, but yeah. Oh, yeah, just... I totally get that. But again, that's sort of once you come to terms with the monarchical vision and what that's going on with that, once you sort of see it for what it is, then you can more easily just give it the finger and say, you know, ah, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to play that game. I can if I'm in relationship with someone. But that's much more personal because, again, it's like, OK, I try to get my mind around Islam you know, I part of what's happened now with the Orthodox among us, I'm trying to get my mind around Christianity because you got all these strange Orthodox people and their beards are long and they're wearing these black robes and they're walking around with big crosses. And it's like, what's up with them? Well, they're Christian. Okay. Uh, I still don't know what's up with them. So then I read a little bit, but maybe um, Seraphim Rose. Okay. So I know a little bit about him, but is that true of all Orthodox? Then the more Orthodox I talk to, I realize, holy cow, there's maybe not as many different variations of orthodoxy as there is of Protestants, but there's a lot. And, you know, how well can they actually intersect? And the fact that, you know, the, the, you know, the Russian Orthodox and the Ukrainian Orthodox aren't getting along terribly well, well, that says something. And so I, I just, I, you know, okay, so then the question, well, the, the whole point of the Heidelberg Catechism is comfort and joy. And the reason that there's so much written about assurance of salvation, let's say, we'll use that language, is because it's hard sometimes. And this gets into the God number one, God number two thing, because, you know, God is God over all the earth. He cares about the Ninevites and their cattle. Um, all right. So, and so basically I just try to give up on trying to be God and say, you know what? God is going to deal with all of them, how God is going to deal with them. And because of what I believe about this God, he will do the right thing. So I'm not going to worry about it. And I have to worry about my relationship with him. Okay. So what you have is not certainty, but you have faith. Is that, is that correct? No, that correct? Because, because you're leaving. <laughs> but, but, but but see again, you 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 embed your certainty in this monarchical vision. Okay, okay, okay. That that somehow, and this is what science does. And so I, you know, I just did this this thing on radio labs because you know, in in 30 years ago, when it came to same sex attracted people, well, they were born that way. Science says so. And now it's not the Christians running around saying, eh, we're not sure about it. It's the trans and the queers and everyone. They're saying, no, it's not that we're born this way. We're free to explore the frontier of gender however we wish. Oh, okay. I, I wouldn't recommend it, but if that's what you're doing, yeah, send back reports. I'm a little curious about what you're going to find. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, it is in some ways a a a a sort of skepticism but it isn't skepticism saying this can't be known that's sort of a monarchical vision skepticism it's a personal skepticism that says i will never know what it's like to be an african woman born in 1830 i see i'll never that's know it. it that's it that's it did you watch uh after socrates Ever i Vakey? watched a few of them did you do some of the practices at all no. Have you ever done a Verveke practice? Not Verveke, but what he popularizes. 
Uh, well, I did. Um, so in my younger years, um, so the, well, let me say how to, let me, let me back keep up talking. I'm getting a lamp. So you, I, I will hear you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to back up the train here. Um, a lot of the things going on right now out there in the broader world were played with, um, were played with in Christianity earlier. So the seeker movement was very modernistic, American, suburban. And part of the pushback on that was um, the Renovare movement or the spiritual discipline movement led by someone like Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard was a professor of uh was a professor of philosophy at University of Southern California. He did his doctoral thesis on Husserl. So he's a phenomenologist. So in a lot of ways, and I figured this out very early on in the whole Peterson thing, a lot of ways, a, an, a version of this that was growing in American evangelicalism was led by Dallas Willard, who, oh, look at that, the phenomenologists over here and the phenomenologists in the Peterson Peugeot pipeline. Isn't that interesting? And what happened with this whole Christian formation thing was, again, Protestants start playing around with meditation, a bunch of these things that are basically very similar to what Verveke is doing. And so even there is a Christian reform minister named Don Postma, uh, taught at uh, U of M, uh, went to the Ann Arbor Church. Um, I have, oh yeah, here it is right here. So this is, let's see. So here's the book, uh, Space for God. There we go. A Study and Practice of Prayer and Spirituality by Don Postma. And this was Bible Way. Bible Way, I believe, is part of the Christian Reform publication. So the Christian Reform Church put this out. And um, let me see the... Um, uh, 1983, publicate, Board of Publications, Christian Reformed Church. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, it's, you've got meditation practices, you've got poetry. You know, someone today would look at this and say, oh, this is, this is very of the corner. This is 1983 in the Christian Reformed Church where, you know, Christian Reformed ministers are playing with R and you know, are those Dutch boats? I bet you they are. Then go. Yeah, there it is. Um, you know, and they're playing with this stuff and it's a big format and, you know, we're meditating and, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So okay. if you're, if you're old enough, this stuff starts. I remember when I first got to this church, there was a retired pastor that was here and I was all excited about this or that. And he'd look at me and say, yeah. And then mention off some things in the seventies that happened and said, yeah, I played with those things in the seventies. And it's just like, this, this stuff comes around. Now, if you're in your twenties, it's new to you. But if you're in your sixties, it's like, it's different, but it's kind of like this because there are a lot of these perennial things that don't really go away. And every generation has to discover them and they'll have new twists. So if I understand you correctly, by the way, you're speaking about it, you're saying that the practices that John Verbeek is trying to popularize have come before and they did not bear enough fruit to stick. No, I wouldn't saying? say that. Okay. I'd say it's similar to your church question. Not all these things are going to stick with everyone. Mm hmm so there's going to be some people that go into a monastery, monastery and do Lectio Divina and do meditation and do this, this, this. There's going to be other people that go out into the world and become soldiers or lawyers or teachers or parents. Yeah. or And so what happens, and this is why religions are massive things, is that massive differentiation happens over time. And... Don Postma has this book on spirituality, but he's not over there in my section on biblical studies. And as a pastor, you kind of have to 
often because churches tend to be geographical because we tend to take time and space, you're going to have some people in your church who are prayer warriors. Then you're going to have other people in your church that are doers. You're going to have other people that are, and then you get into the whole spiritual gifts thing. So there's a, there's a panoply of things out there in the world, but you're going to find a lot of differentiation. So when Verveke's meditation came along, and I'm sure there's plenty of new stuff in there that I haven't tried, but it's sort of like the psychedelic thing that, that maybe it would help me, yada, yada, yada. But I'm, I've basically over my own 60 years developed my own group of spiritual practices that are intended to keep me sane and keep me connected with my Jesus. And so that's what I tend to do at this age. It's like mm -hmm. someone saying, you should take up smoking. But God, at 60, I'm going to take up smoking? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at 80, I could start because the, the odds are that I would, you know, whether yeah, if I will. take up smoking in my 80s, it probably isn't going to really affect my life expectancy. So maybe I'll take up smoking when I'm 8, turn 85. That's good. <laughs> so I asked DC Schindler about the meaning crisis and I have a great admiration for him. And I said, I asked him if he thinks that we should return to the church to answer the meaning crisis. And what do you think he said? Yes. And the it's Catholic church. <laughs> he said, yes. I don't know. I don't know about Catholic church. Oh, I, I have other videos that I can show you where he basically suggests that. <laughs> I, I like him too. I haven't talked to him. He's a guy that it's like, yeah, it'd be interesting to talk to, but I, and if I do, that'd be fine, you know, because a yeah. bunch of other people have talked to him, but I, maybe if I read a book of his or have a question or something like that, I'll seek him out. But yeah. Yeah, if, you, if he wants to talk to me, I'm happy to talk to him, but I, it just doesn't, I, I would, it's more fun for me to, and I know, or uh, people out there and you know it yourself. I mean, you, you've been asking for this slot for a while. And I basically tell people, I say, well, if you're interested long enough, you're probably going to get the chance, but you might lose interest before you get the chance. And that's the hierarchy thing. But I would actually rather talk to a rando because, yeah. you know, and, and you see this in the randos conversations, even though a lot of them aren't watched very widely, people are fascinating. Like, yeah. like the Brandon Dempsey story. I mean, what a great story. It was it's just a great story. But look at my big five. Of course, I would like this. DC Schindler is <laughs> potentially more mapped territory for me. Yeah, and, okay. so, and so what I really would rather have is my Dunbar number not stretched so thin. Because, so, you know, what do I have at Living Stones? It's a group of randos. And... They're really interesting. They really are. So I talked to David. I had a lot of uh, questions for him because his book is one of my favorites about Which Plato. Oh, about uh, Plato's Plato. Critique of Impurities. And I think yeah. it's one of the most brilliant books I've ever read in my life. Um, but I asked him about John as well. The same thing I asked you just now about the practices and what he thinks of them. And if they're an answer to the meaning crisis. And he said that basically he trusts John and he trusts wherever that leads him because he trusts the person. And I thought that was a beautiful answer. And I wonder if you trust John in that sense to, to as a person that is seeking wisdom and meaning that he's going to end up in the right place. And you trust that whatever he does bears fruit. Do you? What I'm about to say should not come as a surprise to anyone. I trust Jesus more than I trust John. No way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, and John and I are going to have a conversation about this whole Hermes business. Oh yeah. I'm That's probably not as exciting. excited. I'm, I'm probably not as bothered about it as some people. Although I, I, I love John. Um, I don't know John that well. You know, I've never had a chance to spend extended peer. I've had some personal time with John off camera and at meals and such. But, um, you know, I've never gone camping with him or done a, you know, done a little holiday somewhere with him where we get 
you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner together, and we can talk, you know, and, and tell kinds of things that aren't going to be on YouTube. So um, I, I'm not anxious about John with respect to his meditation stuff, partly because of the, I, I think the secular box, I think there is some spiritual safety in the secular box, but you can't push it too far. And so what exactly is happening with Hermes stepping into the conversation and saying, you're going to listen to me now. Oh, that could be a lot of different things. So I've, um, I've got some concerns for him, not really about him, but for him. I think uh, the safest place is to be, the safest place in the storm is to be in the boat with Jesus. Now, you could be out there freaking out and saying to him, don't you care if we die? Um, but the safest place is to be in the boat with Jesus. And so as much as possible, I recommend to my friends that they get in the boat with Jesus. Um, but it's there again, their relationship with God is between them and God. And I've got opinions. I'll share them. I'll try not to be a jerk about it. But um, I think, John, I think. Oh, I think similar things about Jordan Peterson. I think God is working through John's life and God is working through John's project. And the reason I believe that is I see good fruit from John's project. And so I do trust John. I do trust John a lot. But I also know, let's say Jonathan Peugeot. Jonathan Peugeot is in the boat with Jesus. But there are also dangers in Jonathan Peugeot's project too. So that's such, as? such as fame. Fame is always a danger. Um, you know, I, I'm glad Jonathan Peugeot doesn't have seven million YouTube subscribers. That's destabilizing. It's He's destabilizing. got a lot though. What's that? He's got a lot though. He's on like what two hundred two hundred Yeah, two hundred thousand. But that's that is a lot. It's as as Christian Baxter said, channel that can't break thirty. <laughs> I think we'll break thirty, but it'll be we'll break it because these these numbers really don't tell the whole tale. And there's a video I want to make about that, but haven't made it yet. But if you look at, it's really hard to evaluate influence by looking at you the YouTube analytics that are publicly available it's hard to tell because you don't know how long people are watching a given video and you don't know how much the stuff in that video is actually landing in people and again for me that's part of why i prefer my corner to be little because okay i make these videos and i send them out there what what are they doing in people and if i can actually build a relationship and talk to them I can begin to discover what they're doing in people at a at a at a higher resolution level. So um yeah, no, I trust John and I like John, but um yeah, the Hermes thing, hmm. That's that that's I'm I'm nervous. Maybe after I talk to him, I'll feel settled down about it. I don't know. But I I care for John and because I care for John but there are dangers inside and outside the boat. I just prefer my people in the boat with Jesus and Jesus can, you know, oh, you have little faith. How long do I have to deal with your faithlessness? That's not fun to hear. But um, I, I prefer, I prefer my friends in the boat if they can, if they can stomach it, but that's, that's between them and Jesus. Jesus tells the Gadarene demoniac, I healed you. You stay here and talk to people. Um, you know, Jesus, some people Jesus calls and they say no. Some people Jesus calls and they say yes. Some people Jesus set, commands and says, well, you go and you go do this work over here. You'll never be part of my chosen 12 or my 72, but you go do that work. They're obeying God. So I'm not judge of them and I'm not going to start because when I start being judge of them, I'm in trouble. You know, it's so funny. I believe in the Bible. Well, how about that? Judge not, lest you be not judged. Because by the measure you use for others, it will be used on you. You want to take that verse seriously? 
And it's tough, but you still have to use discernment. So, you know, you got some opponent processing there, but. Do you believe that other gods exist? Oh, yeah. Zeus also. exists. <laughs> it's a, what it's a Zeus? more interesting what question. What are these gods? Yes. Can you answer that? Hermes exists. What showed up for what showed up for John? I don't know. This is so ancient gods. Have you read American Gods, that book by Gaiman? I think it was. It's an interesting I don't book. Think so. It's a no. very interesting book. And I think he gets a lot right about what on earth these gods are. You know, the So, so the gods, you know how, you know how Marys show up all over Latin America? You're interested in Latin America. Yes. There's La Virgen yes, yes, de yes. Guadalupe. There's La Absolutely. Virgen de Alta Gracia in the Dominican Republic. There's La Virgen de this, La Virgen de that. You got the virgin showing up all over uh -huh. the place. Well, is it one virgin, virgin or many virgins? That's not an easy question to answer. It is one virgin, but it's also kind of many virgins. Mm-hmm. And the gods are like that in that, you know, why is Eros a god? And at least in Renaissance painting, a little chubby uh, god with a bow and arrow. Um, why is Eros a god? Well, that god takes us over. And so part of the part of the difficulty that we have reading ancient texts is that we can we can only help reading them with our eyes. Now, everything that I said about, yeah, I, I only have my eyes to read with, but I can work hard on trying to, at least to one degree or another, and I think this is what Tom Holland has been helpful with, try to understand and have a little bit of humility about the strangeness. So um, to what degree, So, so we can talk about these gods to what degree are these gods are these gods immortal or are they perennial perennial also well eros is perennial but what 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 version of these gods were the greeks talking about mm. because you know we could we could say communism is a god yeah. Is communism a god? Kind of. Now we don't use that, we don't frame it that way, but you know, well, there's a hammer and sickle, and there's everybody paying attention to it. There are instantiations. There are is democracy a god? Now in the 19th century, you know, in American coinage, all the way up until the Second World War, I mean, Mercury was on a dime. You know, there he was, Hermes on a little dime with his winged cap on American dimes until Roosevelt. Are, is Roosevelt a god? I have this great illustration that I use in my sermon sometime about a story during the Trump presidency when Trump was visiting India. And this dude set up a life-size statue of Donald Trump, put wreaths of flowers on him, was burning incense to him, and was praying to him. He had a Trump t-shirt on. And... They understand what gods are in India. Yeah. So Trump is a god. And, you know, again, if you read ancient literature, it makes perfect sense. Uh -huh. Now it gets a little, it gets a little interesting because of the historicity that we've worked with with respect to these things. And so we say, oh, Zeus isn't real. But of course, Peugeot had the temerity to say, no, Zeus is real. So is Santa Claus. And and I was just <laughs> I I'm halfway through the Daniel Dennett Jordan Peterson conversation and. Yeah. Again, you start hearing this stuff. I did a little bit this with Brendan Dempsey in my first conversation. You start hearing the way Daniel Dennett talks, and it's like, you know, yeah, those are patterns, but they're not real. It's like patterns aren't real. Tell me how real, yeah, how unreal patterns are. I mean, what is a heart attack? Heart attacks are patterns. Yeah. That's what they are. Real is a heart attack. We say that. So Heart attacks aren't real. Zeus isn't real. But it takes sort of a frame shift that you begin to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How? What? 
what 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 do you mean and once you begin to sort of get beyond that and understand how it's going well then new vistas open up yeah but it seems like to me then christianity is not necessarily monotheism if if we understand god to be the highest god so we do not reject the idea that there exist other gods but we simply put god at number one well michael heiser if you read, I mean, he passed away not too long ago. I mean, he he wrote all, a ton of this stuff and yeah. people were lapping it up because he, the close reading of the Old Testament, you know, who, who are these Elohim? And sometimes Elohim is the Lord, yeah. and, but there are these other Elohim. And what are they? And how are we supposed to think about them? All in, you know, this very monotheistic testament. So, you know, what, what was, what was, what did Abraham know and when did he know it? Boy, that's a hard question to answer, but could be a lot of fun to play with. Was he a henotheist? Well, I don't think the word henotheist is very old. And like I said, there's all these forks in our knowledge as we go. And Barfield would point to these and say, you know, Wind and spirit were the same thing. What was in the minds of people for whom wind and spirit were the same thing? Yeah. And can you actually sort of get back to that? And I think so. And and sort of, sort of getting there is, and Barfield sort of got this right. You first have to sort of separate them. And once you separate them, then you can sort of understand the mapping. But they're still not exactly the same. But, and that's kind of where we're at right now. So talk about Daniel Dennett saying that patterns aren't real. Do you think that he's uh, he's like thinking materialistically because he talked to Viveki and he's more of a, he, he speaks about physicalism because you don't, you have energy also as taken as real. Did Dennett speak to Viveki? No, no, no. But I was thinking oh. about Viveki speaking about this idea of like, yeah. Energy being real, of course, patterns, they're real in a way. Hyper um, objects. Yeah. That book. Yeah, I think that. It's so, so funny if you say evolution isn't real. You're either an odd materialist that yeah. doesn't think that patterns are real, or you're a conservative Christian. <laughs> funny the way these things work, isn't it? Yeah. Now, Daniel Dennett would say, of course, evolution is real. Is it a thing? And that's where Verveke, see, John is, what John is doing is sort of covering, John is out there on the frontiers, as is Peterson. But a lot of people like Dennett, they're, they're, they're not frontiering. They've got their yeah. career. They've, they, they've got their little, they've got their little watch and they're guarding it. And that's what they're doing. Uh, that's so wild to me, actually, because so many people are still in that paradigm. Oh yeah, the majority of people, but that's always but it, the way it is. But it's so absurd. Like it, it, it seems so absurd when you're talking about these things, and then people want reality to be measurable. And I just, I just can't even understand. Sometimes I begin to speak about God with people around me, and just the way they speak within two sentences, I'm like, oh no, I cannot even have a conversation about this. It's right, impossible. Right. You don't. You you are not a sufficient exorcist. That's what's fun about the Jordan Peterson Dennett. It's like. Jordan's put put on his exorcist, his exorcist clothing, and he's gonna see what can I, how far can I get with Daniel Dennett? <laughs> and that's what that whole conversation is. How far can I get with you? And you don't even really know what I'm doing, but a whole a whole bunch of people out there watching know exactly what I'm doing. But you, Daniel Dennett, who are one of the two people in the conversation, probably don't really know what I'm doing. That's so funny, actually. It <laughs> is. It is. It's a weird little world. Plan. What do you do? You think you able to understand atheists at all? Because yeah, you've never been an atheist. Are you able to really understand that? I have felt the pull. When? I've had the doubts. You know, I I mentioned before that you know before I ever got started on a lot of this stuff. You know, I I was I was kind of reading C.S. Lewis's miracles twice a year just to you know not be a hypocrite uh, so I yeah i i've lived in the blue church i've lived in secular land i 
go to the doctor. I have an education. I read books. So no, I think I have a some understanding of because because you know there, there's these categories. You know, you talked again about being a Christian. You know, nowhere in the in the Gospels do you, do you hear Jesus using that language. That language came after, of course. Yeah. So, you know, Jesus uses other language. Are you disciple? Do you follow me? And Jesus uses pretty stock Second Temple Judaism terms, not the Christian terms that will develop in his wake fairly soon after. So um, these labels, we can't live without them, but we have to use them guardedly because there's a lot of atheism in me. And how can there not be given when I was, when I am living. Is Jordan a Christian? Does he trust Jesus more than he trusts himself? I'd say so. Well, then in your book he is. It's funny, some people, they listen to Jordan and they think he's an atheist. That's the people that like Jordan for his sciencey stuff. Yeah. And then the other, other a case is true with people that like his religion stuff it's like wow you're actually orthodox you're a christian it's funny how that goes yeah so and and you know i think again as with as with john verveke god is using him god has him on a path mm. and i'm i i believe that and so god god is god I, we really have to stop trying to move God aside and say, you're doing it wrong. Here, let me. I can't even run my own life. Never mind somebody else's. There are three paths that David Schindler described, one of beauty, truth, or goodness. Um, and he said that everyone basically in their life has the one that they hmm. are driven by the most. Hmm. Which one of those three is that for you, do you think? And has that changed, perhaps? Mm, boy, that's a good question. That's a really good question. I'm going to have some cake to fortify myself. <laughs> this, uh... Seventh grade cake. Seventh grade cake. It's good. It's good. Good. I think it does change. I think probably goodness it would probably be goodness truth and beauty yeah it would probably be in that order yeah has that always been the case probably i think there's something temperamental about us with respect to and you can get at it with big five and some of these other you know people like the enneagram i i think i took it once i don't even know what number i am um i might have that somewhere in my files too but um yeah. I don't I don't know much, but yeah, I think he's right that people will tend to be because, you know, I, I love this Jonathan Edwards idea about Jesus, his diverse excellencies. You know, I love the idea because it always pops up in my sermons. Um, but that one, one of the amazing things about Jesus was Jesus could hold together. We'll just use this, these transcendentals, truth, goodness and beauty. He could hold them all together in a way together that I can't. And because I can't, it's like I have to sort of line them up because I can't hold them this way. So I have to kind of hold them this way. So Jesus could hold, he was strong enough to hold them this way because there's tensions between them too. And so I think for most of us, we, we can't handle the diverse excellencies the way Jesus could. So, um, yeah, we... Oh, it's a great observation. That's I'm, I'm probably going to steal that. Pastors are thieves. Be careful what you show them because they'll say, "Ooh, I like that. I'm going to use that." Nice. You go to my Take pastor's. It. Go to my pastor's bag of tricks, and you're doing something, and people play this one on you. See what you do. <laughs> well, I don't think the ideas are owned by any of us. So no, no, we you just take we it just pass like. them around. <laughs> Let's see what I want to ask about. What is the movie you've watched the most, Paul? Oh, there's a good question. Movie I've watched the most. I've watched The Matrix a lot. I've watched Band of Brothers, even just oh, for yeah. the soundtrack. 
<laughs> I mean, Grim Grizz always has a saving story. I always choose heart. Band of Brothers, it's all about heart. Yeah. Um, when I was in, when I was your age, I watched The Razor's Edge, the Bill Murray movie, Somerset Mom's book. It's interesting, interesting thing for a for a guy in his young early twenties. That was a favorite book in college. Um, Oh, I'll, I, I, you know, I guess technically, probably the answer is Lord of the Rings trilogy, <laughs> because we watch them every we watch them like Christmas to New Year's with my kids. We've been doing that for really? years. And so I don't repeat watch a lot of movies. Um, but yeah, I guess it'd have to be Lord of the Rings. Did you watch Dune? I did. Have you read? Sorry, you did. I have read and watched. I read Dune when I was closer to your age. I I got I think halfway through book four. Okay. So, so and then I I did the audio book. I was driving my kids to high school, and um, I'd always look for audio books or something to to listen with them and to do that with them. And so I did Dune with my kids then again, and then I just reread the first dune book after before seeing the um before seeing the second film all right let's get your thoughts i just did this this weekend with aaron it was really fun well and the the books are complex they mm -hmm. really are and the mood this movie unlike the you know the movie from the 80s which just kind of got silly um yeah. and, and kind of crazy this this the world creation of this movie was amazing. But having just read the book and then what it's it, if you really want to enjoy a movie, don't watch the book. Don't read the book right before you watch the movie, because you have to make decisions in a movie. Yeah. And like the Southern fundamentalists, really, really? Did he did he really decide? I mean, I remember the first time it was said in the movie, I thought. I'll, I'll forgive you at once, but if I hear it again, I'm not going to be happy. And I heard it again and again and again. It's like, really, the Southern fundamentalists are we? Are we really this American centric here? That that just sort of, you know. So that kind of that kind of ticked me off. Um, it's a it's a really hard book to adapt. It's super hard because it is very complex and you know even just the frame of the book where you begin with the princess Errolon and with his sister and with because already in these little you know these little chapter headings you get inklings that oh yeah Muad'Dib is going to defeat the emperor and become the emperor and and so what i really like about what at least what herbert tried is it's really easy to get excited about the hero's journey. Freddie has not called me. I think it's Freddie. It changed his number. He's called me 10 times in the course of this. So after, after I get off, I'm going to have to call Freddie. So if you don't know who Freddie is, watch the Freddie and Paul show. Um, <laughs> but um, what I appreciate about Herbert is that he knows the hero's journey and he also understands that he understands something that let's say the David cycle understands in the Bible. I mean, first Samuel, you know, it's, it's just, I, I, there's someone that I really hope gets a chance because he's been working on the David story to adapt it to a, um, a television series. And he's got some really cool ideas about it and i hope he gets his way i don't know i fear he won't just because of the way things are but i i so often every time i read the book of samuel i think this is this, this is an amazing story yeah, the story is so good and it's yeah. so well told and it's so wonderful and so you see david and he's i mean it is just the quintessential hero's journey and yeah. Goliath and Saul's son-in-law and ducking the spear and going out into the wilderness and having yeah. a Philistine city. And it's just, it's just amazing. But then he becomes king 
and what happens after he becomes king. That's where the battles are. Yeah. And that's where you're truly tested. They go all the way back to where we started this conversation. Yes. Beautiful. You know, it can be so exciting to run up your channel and get it big and make a name for yourself and become famous and be able to, you know, be able to have Elon Musk's cell phone and have him answer when you call. You think, wow, you know, that would be the most amazing thing to have, you know, Elon sitting there one day thinking about his various companies and saying, gosh, I don't know. I wonder what my friend Lucas would think. Should we, should we, should we offer the cyber truck in colors or stick with stainless? Lucas, what do you think? I mean, it's like, wow, wouldn't I like to be that guy? And the book of David's, uh, the book of Samuel says, do you really want to be that guy? You don't know what is involved in getting what you wish. And this yeah. isn't even framed as David's wish. This is framed as, you know, as God's work through David. But, I mean, the story ends so painfully, you know? The, the the Absalom story and then and the, the Bible is just so brutally honest because it would be it would be so tempting to write a a David hagiography but you know David you know he's weeping for Absalom and you know his his general comes and says look you want to have a kingdom tomorrow you better sort yourself out because all of your troops have just expended energy blood and put their lives on the line against this kid and you're now sounding like you wish you were dead how do you think that makes them feel what are you doing and you know nathan you are that man and then you know even at the end with the power struggle for who's going to succeed david and nathan and bathsheba versus you know and it's just it's it's just the most amazing story. And it's so real in that, yeah, you know, we love the hero's journey. All right. But the real test is after they have become the king and they are now the hero. What now will you do? And the, the story could have focused on the way that David subjugated Edom and Ammon and uh, Moab and all of his neighbors and the way that David, you know, you'll get some of that in Solomon, but story could have focused there, but it doesn't. And Dune has some of that. And so that's part of the reason I respect it because yeah. it knows to become king is one thing. In some ways, relatively easy. Just, you know, and David doesn't even do it. I mean, kill the present king and replace him. That's the way... Most people become king or inherit it. So that's relatively easy. Now, being a good king, oh, 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 way harder. I want to clip that out like a Santa Claus clip. You said you it go. so perfectly. You said, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> good. That is awesome. You, you can have some branding. <laughs> branding for your channel. Oh, yeah. We'll do that. I... Um... I discussed doing this weekend with Aaron and yeah? stuff. What did you guys mind. think? I gotta, I gotta oh. check. I gotta check on my ladies here. I got, I got the camera, but keep talking. I can hear you. Of course, I keep talking. the The main thing that we felt was that the heart was missing. The the emotions, let's say, hmm. it's hard to connect with the characters. Ah, yeah, yeah. You know I could see that. It is very. It's like a war movie in many ways. It's yeah. a, it's a movie about Mars. You know. And yeah. it's it's very epic, but then I don't feel the connection between Paul and I'm forgetting the the girl's name, but it's just not as Chani. Yeah, Chani. The, I feel that love, love is what what missed for me. Well, I and I don't think the movie it. communicated as as well as the book. Yeah, I agree. And again, I think part of my criticism often for these adaptations are. This is an adaptation in 2024, and the book was written in the 60s, and feminism demanded that Chani 
be a certain way for the 2024 audience and they would have they would have not they would i mean basically okay princess irulan and shani and you know the the boy am i going to get in trouble for what i'm about to say um women in the 1960s un, in a certain way understood certain things that cultural norms required of them and they fulfilled them now well, that itself isn't um dangerous but how you think about that men continue today to have to follow certain norms because if a woman gets upset they call the therapist but if a man gets upset they call the police and rightfully so so i there were i if 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 they hadn't adapted the book to an audience 50 years later, people would have been upset. Mm -hmm. And and there would have been all kinds of YouTube videos and things about how dare Chani just accept her role as a concubine. But that's an important element of the book because it has to do with his mother and her accepting the role as a concubine. And so, you know, there there's a logic in the book that the contemporizing adaptation, because I mean, if they if they make Channy, because they they want Channy to be a strong, independent woman, she just has to do that, and they don't understand that for some women, being strong and independent means taking on certain yokes to achieve certain outcomes. Yeah. That's what that's what Jessica did. Yeah, she stayed. The concubine. Now, Leto says, you know, I should have, I should have made you my wife. I was, um, I was, I was a fool. Well, and this is the tension in the story. And it's the tension that has to do with a concubine and that whole idea of what concubines are. And it's, it's rich in the story. And if you just say, if you just make modern Chani a strong, independent woman, that's like, oh, okay. Well then, you know, you, you've, but they're living within a social structure yeah. that the world creation has made, where you still kind of have an ancient world situation where there's concubines, and a concubine is a real thing. And and the fact that the king marries for politics but loves his concubine, that's a real thing, and people would understand that, but. You know, talk about enforced monogamy. She has to be his person. Yeah. Okay. I'm and and, and I wonder what what they'll play with then, because when you get to the start of the second book, spoiler alert, book's been out a little while. Princess Erolon is meeting with some conspirators that are thinking of assassinating him. And you know, so the book has a logic to it. Yeah. And this is part of the problem with movies that there are sensibilities that when violated in a movie are not tolerated, but they can be violated in books. Yeah. I want to speak a little bit about Jordan because you're such an expert on him. <laughs> I don't know how expert I am. I have spent a lot of I, time on him at least. Thinking I, about I, it. I've had less contact with him than I've had with Peugeot and, and uh, Verveke, so... But I've Perhaps watched a lot see. of hours. I've got a lot of hours logged listening to him. Yeah, I think you see better from the distance, to be honest, with a figure like this one. For uh, Jonathan, uh, sorry, John Verveke said that Jordan is Moses in many ways. Um, he described Jordan to Moses, and he described himself as Socrates. <laughs> and so what I find interesting with a Moses role, I mean, he's kind of building an empire and leading a people almost with the R conference is taking form where I see Jordan getting more and more influence and people look is up to it. Jordan's influence growing. Is Jordan's influence growing. I think he has less influence today than he did in 2018. I don't know about that. I think explicitly it might not be, but 
I think his ideas are starting to take hold because all the people that followed him in 2000, what do you say, 17, 19, um, these people are now embodying a lot of that. So yeah. in many ways, yeah. it's now taking form. Yeah. And so we have a Jordan Peterson army in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering with Jordan, do you think, having watched this phenomenon for these years, that he has remained true to himself that he has remained authentic as far as he could i think he is i think he i think he is who he is i think that cake was baked um, yes <laughs> i think and my 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 comment in terms of influence had everything to do with their thanks to sort of the hit job that was done on him by the blue church there are hosts of people that once the name, we have to land the plane soon because the dog and the ladies are going to be. Yeah, there. of course, of course. Um, there are there are hosts of people that once Jordan Peterson is named, they will stop listening. Now, yeah. let's be fair. We had different kinds of love. There are different kinds of influence. Um, I think he he. See, the Moses thing is interesting in that there are some mosaic qualities to this. But I... See, Moses had Israel. Yeah. Jordan Peters, the, the first talk back with Peugeot, Peugeot really kind of challenged him and said, you, you need a covering. You need to be under authority. You need to be in a church. Now, Jordan, you know, I'm on the border of things. Okay. The difficulty is that you, you have fans. You have influence in your fan base. But what kind of body can fans create? So, and I've had, you know, it's been interesting just in terms of what I've done. Because I also, like Jordan, in some ways, I've resisted. I, I didn't start the Paul Vanderclay Company or Estuary Inc. or any of these things. Uh, two, three years ago, people were kind of, you need to you need to start this one thing so that we can sort of have a formal structure and so on and so forth. I didn't want to do that. I I, I wanted. Um, I think there is a body, and sometimes it's called this little corner. Um, Sometimes it's a flotilla. Uh, it's still kind of amorphous. There is a body sort of around me, but I have always wanted that body to not be just sort of downstream. I don't want them to, I don't want there to be Vanderclayians the way there are Calvinists or Lutherans or Petersonians or Peugeotians or Vervakians. I don't want there to be Vanderclayians. And, um, I think Jordan some I don't know what Jordan wants. I I think you know Jordan was captured by the status rocket that took him up into orbit and in many ways he spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out what to do with it. And so he's been making videos, he joined Daily Wire which time will tell whether that whether or not that was a good move. Um He's continuing to do his tour and I can't criticize him for not having a plan because I don't have a plan, but I think he does look at certain kinds of metrics to figure out influence and impact. Now he is more willing to play with politicians than I am. Um, I am much more, geared and oriented towards something church-like that's natural i'm a pastor and so i look at i was just thinking this morning how there's whole bunches of people in this corner that are like elders and deacons and it's a, the weirdest church you could imagine because of course we've got unitarians and atheists and new agers and people who like psychedelics and people who don't and renewed roman catholics and ortho bros we got all those people in this strange body but um I've, I've never wanted this body to be too distinct or have skin that is too firm. 
And and that's part of the reason I didn't want to start something that it would be very easily identifiable if you were mm -hmm. in or out. Yes. And so what Peterson has is a hard thing to think about. So that's why part of the reason why this arc endeavor is so interesting. But they've only done one event. And yeah. it was, I think it was a big success in that they drew a lot of people to it and high status people and influential people. I'm not sure they quite know what to do with their audience. And I think he's got fans and he's got an audience. And I think part of him is continuing to work the, the therapist mission, but instead of doing one-on-one -on -one in that therapist box, now he's doing stage to audience. And he's been effective at that, clearly so. But where this goes, whereas Moses, you know, they had the, you know, they had the children of Israel plus all the other ones who came up from Egypt. And then they then were cohered by the covenant into Israel. And they had a very definite body. I'm still not sure what Jordan's body looks like. So. That's a good answer. I'm going to be respectful of your time. All Thank right. You so for these, uh, these two hours. It's Lucas, it was, it was wonderful talking to you. Had a great time. And Thank say you. Say hello to your father and your brother from me. Will do. Will do. By the way, I'll upload on Sunday. Um, I'll send you the file. You can upload it. Oh, I've got a copy of the file here too. So, you know, Oh, you got it. Yeah. Perfect. So we're awesome. Good. Thank you so All right, much. Lucas. Thank you for your time. Take care. Bye-bye.